Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Debrett's Hosting and Dining webinar Q&A. Now, I just need to check the systems just to check that everything is working. So um, one of the challenges of this system is I just need to know that people can hear me. And so if somebody would love to drop me a little note just to let, <laughs> let me know that, A, there's somebody out there. Liam, thank you very much indeed. Good to hear from you, Liam. Great to know you can hear me. Well, Christmas is going to be a little different for us all this year. It's been quite a year, a different sort of a year. Um, and I know that we have people joining us from different parts of the world. And I know that's going to mean that uh, some of you will have um, quite restricted Christmases. Um, we, I believe, at uh, here in the UK, at last, last check, are still going to have a Christmas. But um, restrictions are quite bad. And there is a need to absolutely be careful, uh, regardless of what the restrictions are in your country. We need to be careful. So whilst there is still the possibility of having some sort of Christmas, uh, we're here to help you with your Christmas conundrums. Um, and the bottom line is we hope you will be able to have a great Christmas, regardless of what's going on. Um, I'm here to help with the Christmas conundrums, and I'm thinking here of things around hosting, dining, etiquette, British traditions, uh, having guests or being a guest, um, and, and how you manage the whole COVID piece as well. And um, be very happy to take questions on all of all of the above. Um, now, we, we have a motive for doing this which is we are uh, we have just published recent relatively recently a new book the debrett's guide to hosting and entertaining which has become available there we go i promise you this won't be the last time you see the book in this webinar and um not all of the answers today will necessarily come directly from the book they may come from wider debrett's knowledge and they may indeed come from me directly and um, i should just say because this is christmas uh, and in lieu of the fact that I'm uh, I'm not going to be able to have a drink with my Debrett's colleagues this year because of the restrictions, I do get to have a Christmas drink with friends of Debrett's. So cheers, and it is lovely to have you all joining us. Um, that said, if I have too many of these, some of the answers to some of the questions may go a little off-piste. Now, um, The Guide to Hosting and Entertaining. A fabulous book, you'd expect me to say that, but it is... Fabulous in that it is incredibly detailed and beautifully presented. And it covers everything from, from the golden rules, the principles of hosting and dining. Uh, it's a blend of history, tradition, menu suggestions, uh, decorating advice, how to decorate the house, how to decorate the table, uh, how to present food. And then there is practical advice on how to... Um, how to cook the food. It's not a detailed cookbook, but there are some, some really good things in there. And um, what to serve and, and how to serve it or what to serve it with as well. And there's an immense amount of detail in there. And I'm pretty confident that a lot of the questions that we have today will be answered from the book. Now, we've also had a few email, a few questions emailed in advance as well. So I've got a few of those to deal with. But I would be delighted to have questions from you. And um, what I'd love to do, if you could fire your questions into the questions chat. If you look, you've got chat and questions as options. Questions into questions and then all the other chat in the chat piece. Uh, and I might even fire a few questions your way to, to answer in the chat. And, but if we keep questions to me in the questions piece, then, then I'll be able to find them uh, more quickly and easily. OK. Um, let me make a start. So let me just see what has come in on the chat. And it is lovely to have people joining from Heidi, joining from Tennessee. Oh, we have one, uh, Courtney from Michigan. And yes, we have uh, Siberia, Tatiana from Siberia. Fabulous. Um, and uh, Poland, Switzerland, Barcelona. Fabulous. We have people joining from all over the world and we'll be able to um, draw on a little bit of your, your knowledge and your views. What I'm going to do 
now we have had some first questions in. Great, I'm going to get to that in a minute. Okay, so the first the first question that somebody sent in in advance was a question from Ian, and let me read his question out. He begins, under the influence, which is a, a curious choice of words, under the influence of our Danish daughter-in-law, we're planning to host our family Christmas dinner on Christmas Eve evening this year. Uh, this small timing change has created widespread unrest among the rest of the family. What do you advise? Um, I'd advise living Danishly if I were you. Um, now, I guess I guess there could be unrest in the family for for very practical reasons, which is that um, people weren't actually planning to be with you on on Christmas Eve. Uh, though in a year like this, I'm not sure what else they'd be doing. But um, my advice to you would be: it sounds fabulous. I would sell it, sell it to the rest of the family. Um, one of the points about the Danish Christmas Eve is that uh, it, Christmas is it all happened on Christmas Eve. I think the moment you tell the children in the family that they get to open the presents a day early, I'm pretty sure that will be a done deal. Um, but nevertheless, um, I think this year, the idea of, um, of of some of the Danish elements of Christmas. So I think um, there are things you'll be having duck instead of turkey. Uh, fried dough balls, Christmas brew, which is just uh, beer, but stronger. Um, do you know, I think there's a lot, a lot to go with a Danish Christmas. So my advice to you is stick with it, give it the hard sell. And I think everybody will get on board with that. And I think it sounds fabulous. OK, um, let's just see. Let's have one more of the, the, the pre sent questions. Uh, this one is from Sarah. Um, Sarah said, I enjoy planning our Christmas festivities in great detail, including selection of wines with each course and meal. Inevitably, guests will often bring wine. Is it polite to store this and can you continue to serve the wine selected or should guests be given the option of enjoying the wine they bought? You can take this in, in either direction. Um, if people specifically say they have bought it to enjoy with a meal, great, go for it. What you don't want to do is have too many bottles open um, because actually the wine may not keep and you'll find you have a surplus of open bottles. So be conscious of that. Uh, particularly if people bring chilled fizz, they, they may want fizz to be opened on, on occasion to celebrate. Um, people may bring things that you possibly might not have thought of, like dessert wines, which are always good. Um, the secret is just to ask. When somebody presents a bottle, you can, if you're in any doubt, just say, is this something you specifically wanted open? So yeah, I wouldn't expect to necessarily open wines during the uh, that, that meal, but it, there are plenty of good reasons for doing it. Okay. Uh, Let's go into a few of the questions here. Great, they are coming in. Um, OK, let's have a look. It's from uh, Harry. Uh, Hi, Rupert, I have a pair of men's handcrafted slippers. Great at home. But what's your opinion outside of the house? I mean, there are two answers to this. One is the very traditional idea that that the the handcrafted slipper was something that you wore in your own home and then that when you go to somebody else's house you would wear your your outdoor shoes things have changed um since those particular etiquette rules were created is that we now have carpeted carpeted uh houses and actually if you're going to visit somebody else's house and you're either going to stay there overnight or you are going to um, spend quite a long time there. Actually, having a pair of indoor shoes, such as handcrafted slippers, might be a bad thing. So there's a good there is a good reason for taking handcrafted slippers uh, to somebody else's Christmas, um, and you're very lucky to have them. Okay, let me go back in. What else have we got here? Um, from Zoe, how do you accommodate people who avoid? RSVPing until the last moment. 
good question. There are two things to think about here. One of which is is space at the table and place sitting. I guess if, at least if they are RSVPing, then the chances are that you will have time to at least set the table. In terms of the food, yeah, I could see why that could be a bit of a challenge. The great thing about Christmas is that we can over cater at Christmas because everything pretty much that goes with the Christmas meal keeps. Uh, and, and some would argue actually much of it is better cold than it was um, hot first time round. So I think that's that's the key thing. But there's no harm in chasing. There's absolutely no harm in chasing. Because what there'll be the reason people don't RSVP is because they're just chaotic and disorganised, uh, and and being and they're a little thoughtless, or or that they're torn and they're trying to balance the needs of do I go here, do I go there, and actually by encouraging people to RSVP, you, hopefully you will then you'll then be able to to pin that pin that down a little little closer to the time. OK, what I thought I might do now, actually, is I'm just going to um, get a few a few thoughts from you. I'd love to know, and I will share this back out with everybody else, which British tradition, which single British tradition is sacrosanct in your household, which is the one very British thing that you will do in your household. And I accept I'm sending this out all over the world, but I know some of the British traditions have been adopted in other parts of the world too. Do drop that down in the chat. And in the meantime, let me dive in for a few more of the questions. <laughs> the interesting one here from uh, Zach. Zach says, I've never liked sprouts and my aunt thinks they're the best part of the Christmas dinner. What's the best way of refusing her offer of sprouts without denting her pride? Interesting. Now, you have to think to yourself here, what, what's worse, refusing and denting a pride, eating them, or third option, cheating and getting caught? So you, you need to think about this strategically. Um, let's have a look at this. Let's talk about cheating first of all. OK, there are some strategies on cheating. The, the problem with Brussels sprouts, um, unlike other food, you can you can give it to the dog under the table and you'll be fine. Unless you've got a Labrador, which will eat anything, then then actually dogs typically won't touch them. You'll end up dropping a sprout on the floor. Uh, take a plastic bag, put it in your pocket, and then put the Brussels sprouts in there. It's a sort of five-year-old approach to it. Um, then, uh, I, I mean, there are other, you can take a manoeuvrist approach, as the military would say. What you could do is you could offer to cook the Brussels sprouts, and then that gives you two options. One is to you help in the kitchen. One is you can then burn them nobody could manage a burnt brassica uh, or you could cook them with so much uh, bacon lard on maple syrup that actually the taste of brussels sprouts would be lost and that would help you navigate your way around that here's my view um i don't know whether you've ever watched i'm a celebrity get me out of here but in my view if uh, an underemployed celebrity can manage to eat the working parts of a male marsupial if i can put it like that um, then, frankly, a Brussels sprout is no challenge. My advice, get on with it. Aunt's cooked dinner. It's the least you can do. How about that? OK. Dive back into the chat here. Um, let's see what else we've got. OK. Any answer to the question? Oop. Lots of people diving in from Dubai and Delhi and Stockholm. Bjorn could certainly help with the, uh, the Scandinavian Christmas. Um, OK, Christmas traditions, Christmas crackers. Absolutely. Um, like a lot of British Christmas traditions, I, I suspect. Actually, I think Christmas crackers might actually be a British tradition. Uh from Rome and the Queen's speech, absolutely. Uh, another vote for Christmas crackers there. Afternoon tea continues even at Christmas. Uh, Katharina, that's an interesting one. I mean, afternoon tea, absolutely. Um, but not full afternoon tea, because if you've had um, a Christmas lunch, then the last thing you're going to be able to cope with is, is anything like a, an afternoon tea. 
just for the sheer scale of it. But yes, tea would be a great, a great palate cleanser. Um, another vote for Christmas crackers, uh, Christmas pudding, <laughs> and uh, from from Sophie, we always have a nap in front of the fire for about thirty minutes after food. I'm not sure that's a British tradition, but it's a great tradition. Great. Let's dive in and have a few more questions. Liam, when is the best time to open presents on Christmas Day? I was thinking of doing a poll on this. It depends who you ask. Um, anybody under the age of about uh, 18 or, or there or thereabouts would probably argue first thing in the morning. It, it comes down to the idea of tradition. I'm going to circle back to this theme, I suspect, a few times. The great thing about Christmas is it comes with traditions, but you can also make, create a lot of your own traditions. And sometimes you just have to go along with them. So some households, particularly the ones with young children, will blitz the presents uh, before before breakfast. Um, I like that sense of anticipation. I, I like holding on till till later in the day. Some families recognise you just can't get away with that. Maybe some some go with the, the, the compromise, which is some children, kids get to open some of their presents early. That keeps them occupied, lets the parents crack on and sort out the rest of the day. And then uh, when everybody's arrived later on, then the presents can be opened then. Yep, that's certainly true. Uh, let's, let me dive into some of the other questions now that were sent in beforehand. Oh, from Toby. I've often held the view that turkey isn't actually a good meat for Christmas dinner and that nobody likes Christmas pudding. He goes on to say, turkey's far too dry and my mother cooks it well, and that everybody would rather eat a chocolate pudding rather than a Christmas pudding. What does de Brett's think of this? Uh, and then he interestingly notes, are these acceptable points or am I the issue? Um, yeah, I don't think you should take it on too much. Um, now, Toby, at the risk of causing offence, does your mother cook it really well? Does that turkey get cooked really well? I've, I've cooked a few turkeys in my time, and um, it is possible to cook them so they're not dry. But I would also add, if the turkey is perhaps a little dry by accident, it then just acts as a better vehicle for gravy, bread sauce, cranberry sauce. So... It's not the end of the world. Um, and, and even when it's dry, it's still a great vehicle for all those those things. And it's great in a risotto, too. Um, other options. Uh, I had an American neighbour here once he used to deep fry his turkey. Quite an industrial process uh, and undertaken outside for safety reasons. But um, that was not a dry turkey, I can assure you. Um, there is always the option of goose as well. Less good cold, um, but guaranteed not to be dry uh, and really good in the risotto. Now onto the vexed issue of the Christmas pudding versus chocolate pudding. Um, how about a compromise? How about mince pies? So you've got some of the filling um, and then uh, you've got um, got the pastry to, to, to soften the blow. Um, I have to say I'm not, not a great fan of Christmas puddings. Um, uh, that's my one British tradition that, um, that I don't, that I haven't really bought into. I mean, if, it, if Christmas pudding is so good, why do you have to put money in it to bribe people to eat it? Uh, so I have some sympathy with the chocolate pudding, um, crowd, but my advice would be that a, a mince pie makes a great, great compromise on that. Okay. Questions piling in here um yorkshire puddings yay or nay from andrew i mean strictly speaking the answer is is no however i said christmas is all about traditions and actually you can create a lot of your own traditions so if you can pass off yorkshire puddings as tradition in your household you're golden, golden. You absolutely got it. So, um, yeah, just tell everyone it's your tradition. And I have to say, you yeah, know, I think Yorkshire pudding would actually go really well anyway. So, um, yeah, I would I would go with it. 
but just make sure you tell everyone it's tradition. Oh yes, here's an interesting one um, from Kitty. How to how to hint to people that the festivities um, are over? As in so many things around uh, etiquette, it's it's all about an an escalation of measures. So um, how about uh, I mean, serving coffee is is indicating that things are concluding. Um, I think in the British tradition, if you stop serving booze, that um, that's a great hint to tell people that the party is is winding up. Um, you can also do things such as um, asking for help with washing up. That often helps clear a room pretty effectively. Um, you can offer to order a taxi for somebody. That's that's quite good. Um, or you could you could escalate that and and take it one stage further. Uh, and peer out of the window and and say, oh, taxi has arrived, uh, and say they're incredibly difficult to get hold of around here. They're like hen's teeth, as we say. Um, and then and then as they go out to, to speak to the taxi driver, you close the door. Uh, that's a bit drastic. Um, maybe you could appear in your pyjamas. Um, might be a bit drastic if you've been serving Christmas lunch, but it would certainly work quite well for uh, an evening festivity. So all of those ways are politely hinting that the festivities are over and uh, and work work pretty well i hope that helps um from courtney here any any tips for making a a smaller christmas special um how small um at the current planning, my Christmas might be me and two Spaniels at the moment. So um, I'm I'm with you on this one, Courtney. Um, go all out. Do it as if. Just scale down the quantities. Um, yeah, maybe a turkey is too much. There was a turkey crown. Or, or maybe if not a turkey, then a goose or a duck. Scale it down and so you don't, you're not left with a mass of it. But do everything you would otherwise do. Um, it's a lot of effort. It's a lot of work, but it's absolutely worth it. And as I said, the great thing about most of the Christmas foods in the British tradition is that actually uh, a lot of them are even better uh, when, they, when they're served um, a day or so later. So I don't think you'll be over-catering there, which, which would be wasteful. Now, um, let, me, let me just throw another, another little uh, challenge out to you. Okay, this might be a bit more um, revealing. What tradition exists in your home, but nowhere else? Because this comes back to the idea that you can invent your own traditions. So drop drop those into the chat. What tradition exists in your house, but nowhere else? Now. Whilst you're doing that, I'm going to dive into a few other a few other questions that we had earlier. Um, yeah, interesting one from Peggy here. How to politely tell someone that they're being a bore and they need to join in with the post post Christmas dinner games. I mean, my advice here, Peggy, would be don't tell them they're being a bore because you'll just back them into a corner. Um, I would use charm, tact, subterfuge would be the the better better way of doing it. And I'll tell you for one of the things is that um, anything that smacks of organised fun, that great oxymoron, organised fun, is um, is something that makes a lot of people recoil. So. I would go for the persuading option first um, and encourage and cajole, cajole, that would be good. Uh, and then there's some other things you can try. So you could you could actually try excluding them, but at a cost. So go into the other room and, and take the port with you. Um, and that might just sort of bring them along. Or 
we all have a weakness um, that will just compel them to join in. So uh, in my case, if somebody said, well, it, it, it's a quiz with 80s pop knowledge, great, I'm in. You know, much a reluctance I would be to join in a lot of games, I wouldn't be able to resist that. So I think that's that's a good way of doing it, a sort of um, a certain amount of subterfuge. And they won't even know that they've been um, sucked into to playing playing the Christmas games. OK, let's go back to that question, if I may. Just closing out lots of other people on the, the traditional um, British thing. Only one person said the Queen's speech. Goodness me. Um, and I think I think he might have come in from Poland. OK, um, let's just share some of these other uh, random uh, private private traditions. OK, uh, from Andrew, uh, enormous party popper that goes off at the end of the meal and ruins the cheese board. <laughs> yeah, it, it would. Um, I'm glad to see you haven't felt the need to change that either. Uh, Bjorn, um, rice a la Malta, together with a classic cartoon, uh, at 19.30, about, at 7.30, about the meaning of Christmas, uh, together with the classics comments from Dad. Uh, good, OK. Um, from Zoe, I'm sure other people do this. We get each other a new pair of slippers every year, um, and then uh, we open presents in monogrammed pyjamas on Christmas morning. That is a lovely tradition, Zoe. Beautifully and elegantly done. Uh, the Broshna is saying we mix some Polish, Italian and British traditions uh, because as a family, we come in from different places. Absolutely. That's it. Um, it we, we might be Debrets. We don't have a monopoly on Christmas traditions. Every country has them and they all get mixed up over the years. And I think that's a wonderful way of doing it. Uh, Catherine is serving a wintry salad for lunch and fish for the evening. That sounds um, much less like hard work than a uh, traditional British Christmas uh, dinner. And uh, from Kitty, we watch the holiday armadillo episodes of Friends as we wait for guests to arrive. Good, Th exactly, this is, up to, this is the point. You are more than welcome to invent your own traditions. Um, that's a, an absolutely lovely idea. Right, here we go. We have a few more questions to look at. Um, what to do if you've been invited to a house for Christmas Day but don't want to go around because of the pandemic? Be honest or fib. Be honest. Uh, that's always got to be. the uh, Honesty is almost always the best policy, as I, I would say. Um, just just be alive to the possibility that people who've invited you may not believe you. Um, but regardless, uh, make sure you recognise the day. And if you can send a gift, that would be fabulous. Maybe even join on a quick Zoom call video conference on Christmas Day. Note the use of the important word quick there, uh, because it's, it's very easy for Zoom conferences to go on and on and on. But at least you are making the effort. And... Um, and you're staying safe. There's nothing wrong in staying safe. There are people who are uh, who, who under, underestimate the importance of COVID safety, and and they might be the ones who are extending the invitation. Okay. Uh, Tanya, what's the rule with Christmas card list? Is that that if you send one and don't receive one back two years in a row, they're out? Or am I being too lenient? Um, I'd say you've been quite harsh there, Tonya. Um, this isn't about rules. This is about friendship. Uh, it's not about punishment either, which that does slightly smack off. Um, I know I will send one to a mate and I've not had one from him for at least five years, but I live in hope, so I'd love to hear from him. Um, and I dare say I'll end up getting a card from somebody and I'll go, oh man, I've forgotten them again. Yes, card card list discipline is the key there, and and I can't always pretend it. I get it right. Be forgiving. It is Christmas. If you can't be forgiving at Christmas, when can you be? Um. Oh, here's an interesting one. 
Uh, if I felt compelled to give a Christmas toast, what are some quick Brett approved words? OK, how do we go down? I would say uh, standard grace for what we're about to receive. Uh, dull but worthy, safe. Uh, Latin grace, slightly showy offy, but you know, sounds good. Uh, if you don't speak Latin, just make one up, some Latin words, stick them all together. Nobody will be any the wiser. Um, or you could go down the irreligious route, which is the uh, the rubber dub dub. Thanks for the grub. A little brief. Uh, my personal favourite, if delivered with due solemnity, I eat my peas with honey. I've done it all my life. It makes the peas taste funny, but it keeps them on the knife. Amen. And again, I think done with serious solemnity um, should set the tone for a very, very jolly meal. I think that was Spike Milligan who wrote that. OK, what else? Uh, more votes. Watching the Queen's speech. I think I think people haven't done justice to the Queen's speech earlier. Uh, oh, good question here. Is re-gifting allowed? Yes, if you don't get caught. Um, is there a timing rule? No, I think the only rule is don't get caught. That's that's the critical thing. I think there's a lot to be said for re-gifting. If you know that somebody's going to appreciate something uh, and it's perhaps not something that, that, that would fit well in your life, it would actually be better used. I mean, that to me just smacks of a really good recycling policy. So I think that would that would be a really good move. Um, back into some of the other questions. Oh, is Prosecco for Bucks Fizz naff? Should it really be champagne? Um, that question has come in from Elsa, but I suspect it may have come in from Princess Anne, who, who has always enjoyed the use of the word naff. Um, I'm going to twist this. Um, Bucks Fizz with good champagne, I would say, would be, in, in your words, naff. Why waste great champagne by, by mixing it with, with orange juice? Um, see, actually, I think it's a trick question. Bucks Fizz with good Prosecco? That's a... That's a trick question. I'm not sure there's such a thing as good Prosecco. Um, as I said, some of these answers may be mine rather than Debrett's. If there is such a thing as good Prosecco, I don't think it's made it out of Italy yet. Um, I'm not doubting its existence, but it's um, nigh on impossible to, to get it here. I know there are, or oh, there were, some bars that would sell the... Um, the sticky alcoholic syrup known as Prosecco on draft. Uh, and I can't think of anything worse, frankly. My shout um, would be, as as it is here, would be go for a good carver. Um, it's the same price as Prosecco and it's way, way better quality for two reasons. Um, one, the right grape and they use carver. They use the same grapes as they use in Champagne. Uh, Pinot Noir, Pinot Meunier, and Chardonnay. And that's, those are the grapes, that, the only grapes you can use in Champagne. But it's also the way they make it. They make carver in the same time-consuming, uh, maturing in the bottle way that Champagne is. And fundamentally, you just get a much better, drier, nicer, nicer drink. Um, so that's my whole take on the um, Prosecco piece, and particularly the carver versus Prosecco. There are, of course, some fabulous British sparkling wines. Actually, these are pretty much as expensive as champagne. So I don't think that helps anybody, but I would encourage you to at least try some of the British um, sparkling wines because they are absolutely fabulous too. Let's see what other questions have appeared. Simeon. I have a cousin who breaks one of my crystal tumblers every year through pure clumsiness. When is it acceptable to start invoicing? Um, I'm not sure invoicing is 
either acceptable or or in any way the answer. Um, and I go back to this idea of uh, of an escalation here, Simeon. Um, so option one, don't get the crystal out at all. That would keep your crystal safe. OK. Um, option two. The. Um, everyone has crystal except the younger members of the table and said cousin who all get plastic. I think that would send out quite a powerful message. Uh, or you could escalate further and just make sure that everyone, including the younger members of the family, get crystal, except said cousin who gets plastic. I'm pretty sure they'd get the message after that. And I think that would probably um, save further breakages. That's my guess. Uh, actually, the first um, one of the few COVID questions um, we have here, which I think is quite telling in itself, that um, whilst we want to be safe, we don't want COVID to take over our Christmas. So Leah is asking how to diffuse a COVID argument or stop one before it starts. Um, yet we're not at the Christmas table yet. Fingers crossed we will be. Uh, to, to my mind, just let everyone know in advance that they will be fined for using the C word at the Christmas table. Leave it at that. Get that out there up front. No use of the C word. That should should sort it out. Uh, and and that will mean that those people who hold vastly different opinions about COVID will not clash at the table. Um, you just need to come up with an imaginative fine in case anybody does. Right. Uh, oh, from uh, Mikhail, Michael, Mikhail. Best way to tell my grandma that H HKLP, holding knife like pen, is frowned on in 2020. Well, to, to quote the great um, Christmas sage, Idina Menzel, Michael, let it go. Um, if, if she has made it to the esteemed rank of grandma, then you should be cutting her some slack. Um, if she's made it to the rank of grandma, she outranks you anyway. Um, and you should be celebrating and cherishing your grandma and not uh, imposing uh, your worldview on her. That's my advice. That's that's my advice. I'm pretty sure it'd be the Debrett's advice too. Oh, a, a, an interesting one from um, Harry here. Harry, are we allowed to play Ibble Dibble this year? I'm worried people will think it's too try hard, as he says, because it was in The Crown. Uh, I don't know whether you've seen that episode of Crown. I think this bit is on um, YouTube because actually he was kind enough to send me a link to YouTube, which he says is where they're doing it. Um, yeah, Harry, serious issue. You don't want to be seen as being a try hard. And um, I understand your concerns. I think yes. But what you can do is you can make up a few variants on the rules so that your version is subtly different. So for example, maybe you can say to everyone, right, a reverse sweep and double forfeit on the diagonal and left-handed drinking with extended pinkies in an ironic way. And, and, and basically, if you're then challenged about this, you can say, well, that's how they all played it at Sandringham when I was last there. And, and hopefully, you know, where did you get your nonsense version of rules from? And then hopefully you won't be drawn on the matter and that will be it. And Ibble Dibble can carry on uh, unabated with left-handed drinking and everyone will have a fabulous time. We are now drawing towards the end of the session. Ooh, from Kitty, what's the rule with thank you cards and letters? Uh, Kitty, like much of etiquette, there are no rules, but there are a few guidelines. Um, yes, thank you letters for gifts. Yes, handwritten. And um, critical for children. Absolutely critical for children. Because children don't often necessarily express their gratitude in quite the way you might like on the day. Um, but also it's great for children to appreciate that they have been given something and um, the thanks should continue um, for for a little while and that's that's a great way of doing it and it gets people into the habit of writing good old-fashioned letters uh, and there's no harm in doing a bit of that that would be my my advice 
there. Okay, back into the chat. Ah, and you can choose uh, Francia Corta from Italy. That, I'm assuming, is an alternative to Prosecco, and that maybe that's the good stuff. Maybe that's the stuff we want. Okay, we'll take just a couple more questions, and then I'll give another shameless plug for the, the book. Um, let's see what we have left here. A few questions, make sure I have got all of them. Oh, uh, from AJ. Uh, when I'm hosting Christmas dinner, I always provide a seating plan for the 14 of us. However, this causes a bit of discussion between my siblings and I. The question is, is a seating plan at Christmas dinner a good move or is it too controlling? Uh, my view is not at all. Actually, generally, seating plan is a good idea um, for two reasons. One, because it's great fun to do seating plans. Uh, and at Christmas with the family, it might actually be essential for keeping the peace. So there's two great reasons for doing it. Uh, as I said, it, it ought to be fun. It sounds perhaps like it might not be so so much fun here. So to take the heat out of it, how about uh, draw lots for the seating plan? That's one way of doing it. More fun, ask the children to do it. Because if the children do it, then nobody can argue with that. And they'll have great fun doing it. And they'll be great putting the cards out. <coughs> my advice um don't do it yourself and put the cards out in advance because some people sneak into the room and they'll move everything around beforehand keep it up your sleeve and then and then hit everyone with it at the last minute but if the kids have done it frankly nobody's going to argue with that conscious of time we are heading towards the end of the session i am going to give another shameless plug for our guide to hosting and entertaining it is a fabulous book. Not only is it authoritative, covers everything from high days and holidays, every occasion you could wish for, from picnics, birthdays, weddings, all of this stuff. Um, it has been absolutely updated in every respect so that the text covers the same critical stuff as it did before and more. Um, all of the pictures have been um, upgraded. It is Fabulous. It is very modern as well, covers absolutely everything. And it's, it is a very practical guide. So there's some of the intricacies on that, that might be around etiquette. So you can see the guide to glassware there. But critically, this is also a book that helps you to, to organise and um, it lays things out, as you'd expect, in a really, really helpful way to allow you to plan an event from days out. But to help the event to go smoothly, to look beautiful, for the food to be the right food. And, and it will give you some ideas about what's good to be able to serve and for you to actually be able to enjoy the event at the same time. Um, <clears throat> we'll, we'll send a link out after this session. Um, we'll send an email out. There'll be a link in the email, which takes you very conveniently straight to the book. Uh, the book is £25 and it is not too late to order it for Christmas if you're in the UK. I'm sorry to say, I don't think we'll be able to get it overseas before Christmas. But if you're in the UK, if you order before Friday, then then yep, that will um, that will get to you. Great. Well, that's it from me. I am I'm going to leave you with the wise words of Confucius, who was talking about hospitality, and he said, "Every house guest brings happiness. Some when they arrive." and some when they leave. And on that thought, I am going to dial off, wishing you all a very, very happy Christmas from myself and from all of the DeBretz team. And we look forward to reconnecting with you in the new year. Happy Christmas, have a safe Christmas, and happy new year. <laughs>